Hello, hello. Preparing a sound check for tonight's program. Seeing if I have any early listeners out there today. All right. Doing a sound check this evening. I'm on a little early. This is Steph Morissette coming to you live. Library. We're going to be talking about the common bees of Indiana tonight. Oh, it looks like I have an early bird already on. Hello, Joshua. Welcome to Common Bees of Indiana. Thanks for tuning in tonight and uh, helping me with my sound check there. We'll wait just a uh couple more minutes before I get started in a couple of B stories that I want to discuss tonight. Um, a couple different instances that I had uh, with B encounters growing up. I'm sure many of us have uh, at least one B story that we can recall. We've got just under five minutes before the start of our program tonight. If any of you are tuning in a little bit early, I welcome you to enter your comments into the Facebook feed. I would definitely appreciate hearing from you to see who is all out there that has an interest in bees. We actually have a couple exciting things that are gonna happen at the end of the, the program tonight as well. And I'll briefly discuss those when we do the introduction here in just another few minutes. Good evening again. This is Steph Morissette coming to you from Crawfordsville District Public Library. We've got Common Bees of Indiana coming up here at six o'clock. If any of you are tuning in a little bit early, uh, I encourage you to type in the comments and just give a shout out and say hello. I'd love to hear from you. looks like we're just under three minutes. So I'm not sure how long my two stories are that I want to tell, but I'll go ahead and get those started now so that we can be sure to start on time tonight. The first story, the first B story I have uh, comes from the time I was, I was probably about 12 years old and I was on my grandparents' farm and I had been running through the barn and somehow or another, I managed to disturb some type of bee's nest. And I hadn't realized it until all of a sudden I was being stung repeatedly on the top of my head. And as I ran out of the barn screaming and ter being terrified of uh, being stung by so many bees, my grandmother rescued me and actually dumped me in the cow tank. So the water trough is what saved me from more stings. Uh, I think there's a little bit of humor we can find in that story. Another story I had actually comes from when I was in college. We were on an, edu an educational hike in the woods for one of my classes and the student body in my class, this, my student, fellow students were around the professor and I stepped back slightly off the trail to allow more room for people. And when I did, I stepped on a rotting log and unbeknownst to me, there was a bee's nest under there as well. And so I was stung three times before I realized what was happening. And at that time, I shed my backpack, dropped my notebook, and ran down the trail as fast as I could. When I finally realized I was no longer being chased and I stopped and turned around, 
to my awkward amazement, the entire class, as well as the professor, were both staring at me, or they were staring at me, wondering what in the world had happened. So I awkwardly walked back, picked up my backpack, picked up my notebook, and just said the word bees. So there's a little bit of humor there, too. You have to find in just the, the silly things that happen. But what I like most about sharing those stories um, comes from the fact that I did have a, a great, healthy fear of bees. And it took me a while to look past that fear in order to see how many benefits that we get from bees. And it helped me develop a respect for bees and a greater appreciation for them. And that will be our lead into our program here in just about one minute. Anybody's tuning in right now to say hello? Give me a type in the comments and let me know you're here. I'd appreciate it. Like to like to hear my audience. All right, it is now six o'clock. We will go ahead and begin Common Bees of Indiana. Again, my name is Steph Morissette, and it's my pleasure to bring this program to you on behalf of the Crawfordsville District Public Library. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about um, a variety of different things, but two things that I wanna mention first and foremost, and this uh, goes out to Montgomery County residents. We will be having another book raffle at the end of tonight's program, and it's a book called The Bees in Your Backyard. And so it will be a wealth of information, and I encourage everyone to uh, respond for that raffle, and we can get a free book to you uh, concerning bees like tonight's program. Second of all, I would like to let you know about um, the summer reading program we have going on now. So some of our summer reading patrons who are in our Read Squared reading program, we will have an extra option to find an opportunity for uh, an additional raffle ticket through Read Squared. So if you finish tonight's program and you get the secret code word that I will reveal at the end of the program, and you enter that into your Read Squared app or on the website, you will be uh, issued an additional ticket to be entered into the raffle for the week. So that's some good information. Hey, looks like we have Corinna on here. Hello, Corinna. Hi, Henry. I'm glad you're joining us tonight. It's good to see you. Well, maybe not see you, but see from you because I see your words in your writing. So welcome. Thanks for joining in. Um, and then again, just real quickly, I'm going to give you a brief uh, synopsis of what we'll be discussing. We're going to talk about, um, well, obviously, all the benefits that we can think of from bees, uh, what they provide for us, what they do for us, how they help us. We'll be talking about different kinds of bees, like honeybees and bumblebees, but we'll also talk specifically about the types of bees that work together in a colony. And we'll learn some, just some great identification information on how to tell certain bees apart from one another. And we can do this in a respectful manner and keep our distance if we do have a fear of bees. But as I mentioned before the program started, um, learning about bees really helped me overcome some of the fear that I had from them. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started on tonight's program. When I was discussing before the program, uh, I talked about some fears that I had when I had some experiences with bees when I was younger. But through the help of this program and learning more about bees, I've determined that if I look at life from this angle, if we look at this picture here, that if a bee is gonna land on me, then instead of being scared, why don't I appreciate the fact that the bee might have mistaken me for a flower? And that's just, that's, that's the way it should be. But bees, let's talk bees. Bees provide more than 80% of the total pollination of cultivated crops in the United States. They are one of the main pollinators in the animal kingdom. The US Department of Agriculture estimates that $15 billion worth of crops are pollinated by bees each year. That's an incredible amount. That means for every one in four bites, you can thank a bee for pollinating the plants that you're eating. Interesting bee facts. 
Well, bees can smell, which is interesting, and they also can see in UV light. Bees also have limited night vision. It's more they see shadow and light than it is a true vision. Their brains are only the size of sesame seeds. Bees do not sleep at all. And something that I found highly fascinating is that bees can recognize faces. And they do this with something called configural processing, which is where they take snippets of images from faces, eyes, noses, mouths, and assimilate them together so that they can view all the components and have a recognizable pattern. So they truly can begin to recognize faces. There are over 20,000 species of bees in the entire world, and 4,000 of those are native right here to the United States. And for as tiny as bees are, and for as short or as long as they may live, a single bee will only make one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in its entire life. That's not very much, but these little bees, they're so fascinating in everything that they can do in the limited amount of time that they have. Honey, this is fascinating. Honey is the only food that contains all essential nutrients needed to sustain life. These include things like your enzymes, water, minerals, vitamins, and antioxidants. And even if we think back to the history that we've learned growing up in school, that the pharaohs and ancient Egyptians would actually put jars of honey in the tombs with the pharaohs because honey does not decompose, it doesn't rot, it has all the necessary essential nutrients for life that could help the pharaohs in their afterlife. So historically, honey's also been very important to a lot of different cultures across the world. Honey also aids in digestion. It can help boost our immune system. Uh, we drink honey in our tea sometimes. Um, honey can also, if applied to the body, can heal burns. Uh, we know lemon honey throat drops help alleviate some soreness to our throats that we might have. And a couple other uh, factors that honey has is that it's an antibacterial agent and People have also used it to improve their overall skin quality. It's just any number of ways that honey can be used. Bees, again, bees, bees are all beneficial and non-aggressive unless they're threatened. So that's why our important pollinators, these little insects, um, we, we need to make sure that we have that respect for them so that they can continue to do their jobs for us and for their colony. Bees have hairy bodies and they transport pollen on these little saddlebags they have. If you look in the upper image, you see those two bulging yellow, uh, they're baskets, they're called pollen baskets. And the bees will store the pollen there while they go about their business foraging and then we'll return to the hive and we'll talk about what they do with their pollen baskets uh, when they transfer that back to the hive. We'll discuss that here in a few minutes. But bees can make all kinds of things, not just honey, but they can make wax to build their honeycombs. They can make royal jelly, which is a diet fed specifically to the queen bee. There's also propolis, which is a resin-like compound. It's also been called bee glue. It's very sticky and resinous because it comes from cone-bearing trees. And as we know, cone-bearing trees have a very sticky sap. And so the pollen that comes from cone bearing trees has passed some of that along to the bees for the making of the propolis. And something I want to note here is that honeybees, when they create the honeycomb, which is a hexagonally shaped storage cubicle, hexagonal just simply means six sided. It's the most compact and space saving type of organization or symmetry in nature. And they use the honeycomb for storage of the larva, the eggs, and uh, even food. And as we know that those are all made from wax. We got some other people hopping in here. Hi, Angela, nice to see you tonight or see ya, I like your bee. Looks like we got another Josh on here. Hey, Josh, thanks for tuning in. And why are bees better than knees? Some of you may have heard that old cliche, well, that's just better than the bee's knees. And it sounds really silly, but it's actually a pretty cute pun 
when you think of all the bumble bums that end up out of flowers. And here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different examples of bumble bottoms that are hanging out of flowers. They're too big to get inside to their flower and they're, they're just absolutely adorable. So if I didn't do this program for anything other than these cute bees, this would be it. And of course, who can resist this? A sleeping bumblebee. Just the tiniest little bumblebee asleep on the head of a dandelion. How can you not like bees at this point, right? And we're just getting started. The different types of bees we're going to be discussing tonight aren't all of these bees, but the list is right here on the left-hand side. The first one we're gonna talk about in a little more in depth than the other ones, simply because honeybees are more well-known and uh, we know more about them than we know about other bees, but we'll be learning things about all the bees that we'll be discussing tonight. The first one is a European honeybee. And yes, I did say European honeybee. Then we'll discuss the bumblebee. We'll talk about the carpenter bee. Many of you may have heard of the wood bee. That's another name for the carpenter bee. We'll discuss the mason bee, the digger bee, the leaf cutter bee, and also the sweat bee. Now, this might have prompted some of you to have a thought, well, what about killer bees? Are we gonna talk about killer bees? Well, I didn't list killer bees on here because there are no killer bees in Indiana that we know of at this time. So I kind of left it off the list, but there is one slide towards the end of the program in which we will talk about that just briefly. The European honeybee, those are the honeybees we have here in Indiana. They were originally non-native. By that, it simply means they didn't originate here in the United States, but they now that they live here, they're acclimated, which means they've adapted to their environment. They were brought over to the Americas in the 1600s from Asia and Africa. Now, these little guys are insects, which means they are comprised of a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. They also have antenna, wings, and six legs. These little guys have barrel-shaped bodies and really no type of a waist to them, um, but they still have those pollen baskets, too, and they're just adorable. Um, they get me every time. I just love them. But... Bees eyes, bees, the, the main eyes that we see are the compound eyes on either side of their heads. And these compound eyes are called compound eyes because they're composed of several hundred small lenses. So they get a, a whole bunch of the same image at once that come into their compound eyes so that they can interpret images of what they're seeing. In addition to those compound eyes, Honeybees have three simple eyes. Simple eyes would be eyes like you and I have, where we only have one lens. So they have three simple eyes in a triangular formation. If you look at the inset image there between the two, um, you can see the three triangular eyes there. Now these eyes are mainly for when I discussed the night vision of honeybees. It's not a true night vision in that sense. It's more of, of an ability to notice the different in, in the light and the shadows. So if it's a little bit late, they can still manage to get back to their hive. These guys, as we know, can form large buzzing swarms and they can live in colonies of upwards of 50,000 bees. And in the wild, their preferred habitat is a hollow tree. Uh, but as we know, they, they do use beehives and there are a few different types of beehives uh, three main types to be specific, but I'm not going to delve into that because that's more of a beekeeping uh, program, and this is more of a bee identification program. Hi, Carrie. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Now, the types of honeybees that are in the honeybee hive or in the colony, there are three different types. We have the queen, the worker, and the drone. You can see from the image on the right, they do look different. The queen bee is on the very left. She's the largest. She has the largest abdomen. She's the only queen in the hive. They only tolerate one queen at a time. Her job, her only job is to have a mating flight where once she's developed as the queen and has hatched, we'll have a mating flight and we'll mate with almost as many drones as she can. Drones are the male bees. And you can see there over on the far right, how bulbous his eyes are 
in comparison to the queen and then the worker be in the center. So they have very large eyes. The only job of the drone is to mate with the queen and then he dies. And all the other bees in between that work in the hive that forage for pollen and nectar are all females and they're called worker bees. These are either daughters or sisters of the current queen. And the worker bees perform the majority of hive operations. And we'll discuss here in a second, the different type of jobs that the worker bees have in the hive and what they do during the period of their lifetime for those jobs. Hi, Deli, thanks for tuning in tonight. Glad to see so many uh, names and faces coming up here. Let's talk briefly about the life cycle of honeybee. As we know, there's only one queen in a hive. The queen's job is to mate with drones, return to her hive, and lay as many eggs as she can for the rest of her remaining days. So she'll lay one egg in an individual honeycomb cell or a wax cell. Worker bees will tend to the larva until it's ready to pupate, at which time the cell will be sealed. The uh, baby insect will go through metamorphosis and exit as a worker or a drone. And all this takes place from egg to adult in about 21 days. Uh, and so bees can live a little bit longer than that, um, give or take. Getting back to the queen here quickly, how is a queen selected? Well, she's chosen early in her development to become a future queen. Now, I tried to find uh, how the other worker bees chose the queen, and I really couldn't find any definitive information on why they would choose a particular uh, larva to become the future queen. But when they do select the future queen, she is then fed only a diet of royal jelly, which is a kind of like a protein rich sugary bee jelly. And this allows her to develop her abdomen and her ovaries, which will then in turn be what she needs to do the egg laying for the rest of her life. The royal jelly is kind of tells you where your social status is there because worker jelly is just a combination of fermented pollen and honey. So you have your royal diet and then you have basically your worker diet. And the only difference between a queen bee and worker bees is the diet that the queen is fed over the diet of the worker bee. Interesting, huh? Now worker bees, here's, here's all our ladies that do all the work in the hive. They are all female and they're only female and they're the only ones that sting. So female worker bees are the only ones that sting. However, if they sting you, or shouldn't say you, but if, if someone is stung by a bee, the bee will die because when the stinger is inserted into uh, the victim, then the stinger is lost upon removal and this removes the abdomen as well as the digestive tract of the worker bee and so it does die. Not all bees die after that though. Some bees as we'll see a little further on in the program can inflict more than one sting. Um, the worker bee is the largest population in the hive. They do everything from caring for the, the, the eggs, the young, to making food, to cleaning to doing all the foraging. They even protect and regulate the temperature of the hive. Um, they can regulate the temperature of the hive by um, fanning their wings. And so a great number of bees fanning the wings will keep the hive a little bit cooler. One of the main things I wanted to mention just quickly about the stinger of a bee is that it's what's called a modified ovipositor. Uh, pretty much all female insects have an ovipositor, which is basically a structure or um, an egg laying tube, if you will. So that's how the eggs would exit the female insect's body and go into the ground or wherever it is that the egg will be uh, laid. Worker bees can live up to eight weeks. Generally, it's shorter than that, though. There's a lot of information on this slide, but it's just a little bit more about the types of worker bees and the honeybee caste system. And this system is basically, it's a eusocial structure, which means it's highly organized. And these bees 
um, each have individual roles that they fulfill throughout various time periods in their lives. So there are nurse bees and house bees that care for the young and they get the cells ready for the next egg and make sure everything's tidy. There are undertaker bees that do just the unfortunate job of cleaning up the dead. Architect bees produce wax that builds the honeycomb. And I wanted to mention how these guys do this. I think that's really interesting. The architect bees, when they're chosen for that job at that particular point in their lives, they will exude the wax from pores in their body. And when they do that, they squeeze it through the pores of their abdomen. And when the, when the wax comes out, it's in small flakes. So the bees will get that small flake of wax off their ab abdomen, begin chewing it and making it malleable again, and then putting it to the honeycomb in the area in which it's needed. I just found that fascinating. And then there are honeybees. Honeybees do just that. They go and they make the honey. And bees don't just inherently know how to make honey. They have to be taught how to make honey. And so honeybees learn they have to chew pollen and chew nectar. And this, by doing this, they will eventually dehydrate it enough that it becomes honey. You have queen's attendants, which do just that. They cater to the queen. It's a whole court of worker bees that groom and feed her and tend to her every need. Orager bees are the last stage of the worker bee's life where they solely just collect pollen and nectar and bring it back to the hive for usage. There are guard bees, which do just that. They protect the hive, they protect the queen. If a hive is being threatened, the guard bees can actually exude a pheromone or an odor produced by their body that warns other bees inside the hive of potential danger or a possible threat. And then finally, you have your queen bee, and this, this bee is busy. She can lay up to almost 2,000 eggs per day. She will mate for the two first weeks of her life, and the mating flight I mentioned. Um, if she doesn't take a mating flight, then the queen will only lay uh, eggs that end up in uh, males or drones, so there will only be boy bees. So the importance of taking this mating flight, the queen can then uh, mate with upwards of 15 drones and store their sperm for the remainder of her life while she's laying eggs. And the queen can live up to five years, but she will not tolerate any sisters or daughter queens, and she will kick them out of the colony to start their own if she doesn't kill them. So she's she's really ru rules the roost. The reason I wanted to mention the mating flight too, um, it's all genetics. So I'll just leave it at that. That's that's how the, the bees determine if they're gonna, if she takes her mating flight or she doesn't, genetics determines whether they will be boys or girls. And for the, the worker bees, their life cycle, as I mentioned, they have several different things that they do throughout the course of their lives. And for the first five days or so, they're cleaner bees. They just, they clean up the messes and take care of items that need attended to. And then between six and 12 days, they're eating pollen to also grow. And they're beginning to be nurse bees that take care of, of the brood. Now the nurse bees will feed the older larva before the younger larva. And I thought that was interesting. I figured it might be the other way around and I'm not sure why they feed the older before the younger, but I found that interesting. In about two weeks, the bees are chewing nectar and pollen and learning how to make the honey. The architect bees are working on their wax and building the honeycomb. And always undertaker duties are uh, of high importance. After about 20 days, you'll have guard bees that protect the hive and you'll have scout bees who go on foraging arrays looking for flowers and come back and communicate that to the rest of the nest mates. We'll talk about how they do that here in a minute. And then finally, in the last stages of their lives from adulthood on, 21 days until death, there are foraging bees. So these foraging worker bees, they go out and that's what they do all day long is forage for pollen and nectar and keep returning to the hive to bring it to their nest mates. And we know they do that by using their pollen baskets, but they do this, they get the pollen on them 
and they use they mix it with saliva in their mouth and then they uh, use their tongue and transfer the pollen to their pollen baskets and so the more they lick the pollen it sticks the bigger their their uh, pollen baskets get bees also have what's called a honey stomach and they will drink nectar and as it goes down their throat it goes into what's called their honey stomach where different en enzymes and things, processes happen and occur. And when that honey stomach is full, the bee will then go back to the hive and transfer via mouth to mouth the, the, the nectar from the honey stomach to each bee where it's passed on and chewed and dehydrated and turned into honey. And that honey is then eventually stored in the honeycomb uh, for future use. And one colony can make up to 100 pounds of honey per year in a single hive. That's just incredible. How do bees know how to tell other bees where the pollen and where the nectar is? Where are those flowers? Bees dance. Bees have about three different types of dances that we know for sure. And the first one, which you may have heard of and might be even familiar with, is called the waggle dance. This waggle dance is a specific figure eight dance that bees do to notify their nest mates of flight distance and directional information, where these flowers are from the hive. And the dance uses a series of vibrations, buzzes, and different pulsing sounds that transform into an abstract communication that the other bees can understand. <laughs> Excuse me. And the waggle dance mathematically has been shown through research and observation that the waggle dance is specific to distances greater than 495 feet from the hive. Now, how do bees know that? I, I don't even know how I would know that. The sickle dance is just as it sounds. It's a crescent shaped dance that indicates uh, an intermediate distance between 165 to about 495 feet from the nest. And then finally, we have a round dance, which is a short little jig that's done to represent uh, flowers that are close to the hive. So less than 165 feet around the hive. Um, and so, like I mentioned, this is flight distance and directional information. And it's an abstract form of language that bees can understand. And there's a lot more involved in it than just the numbers that I gave you. There's some complex math involved on how the bees actually do that. So I'm not gonna go into the math, uh, but I did want to present the abstract language that they use. It's actually highly complex. And just to prove that uh, this is something that's been in extensively studied, in 1973, an Austrian uh, scientist by the name of Carl Frisch was awarded a Nobel Prize for the research that he did on the specific honeybee waggle dance. So it's a real thing, people. Drone bees, here we go. We've gotten through the queens, we've gotten through the workers. Now we're gonna talk about the drones for just a minute. As we know, they're all, they're all male. This means they do not have a stinger, so they have no modified ovipositor. They do not collect pollen. Their only job is to mate with the queen anywhere between two to eight weeks of age. And as we mentioned, up to 15 drones could mate with that one queen. But unfortunately, after the drone mates with the queen, he dies. And if there are drones left in a hive at the end of the season, so at the, turn, at the end of autumn, the drones will be kicked out of the hive uh, in order to protect and preserve, preserve food, for, food sources for the remainder of the winter. And how do bees survive the winter? They, they form what's called a winter cluster, and they just, just like that cluster together for warmth in hopes that that will bring them through the winter. Just a couple slides here that I think are really interesting if you ever got close enough to a male and female bee to notice the differences. The, the male uh, drone eyes are significantly larger than the female worker eyes. The male eyes are also located more towards the top of the head, whereas the worker bee's eyes are more to the sides of the head. We can look at body size and abdomen size to see that the drones are larger than the workers. We could even go so far as to um, 
discuss the antenna segments on the male versus the female, but we're not going to go into that. I just wanted to let you know there are a lot of ways you can identify the difference between a male and a female honeybee. Here are some real life images. And on the left hand side of the image, we see there's a female worker bee. You notice her eyes. And then right next to adjacent to that, you see the male or the drone's eyes. They're significantly larger, almost protruding. This is so he has better ability to see a queen even in flight. So his eyes are a prominent feature to help him locate the queen. And then the image on the far right, you see again, the male uh, drone, how bigger, how much bigger he is. And then just to the right of that, the, the female worker bee. And you can also see her stinger there or her modified ovipositor. So that's what I have on the European honeybee. I thought it was important to share the diversification that goes on inside the hive when we don't even see what's going on. So I thought it was important to provide a background uh, to the social structure of the honeybee. But moving on, let's talk about bumblebees. Bumblebees are, they're just my favorite. I love them, they're so cute. They are native to North America. There are 49 species in the United States alone. These guys are so cute and so fuzzy. And this is one of the, the um, key identification factors uh, of identifying this guy, uh, specifically from the carpenter bee. They get their name from the buzzing that they do, the bumbling and buzzing. And they're the most widely recognized pollinator in the pollinator kingdom. You see bumblebee, you think honey. And this bee does make honey. So it's not just the honeybee that makes honey. Other bees are capable of making honey too. So the bumblebee is capable of making honey. These guys are really only alive from spring to fall and all the bees except the queen will die and the queen will actually hibernate in the ground. When they are active, they live in small hives that are near or at the ground level. The queen along with her daughter workers uh, will live together in a, a, a very similar eusocial behavior or the high degree of social organization, similar to the honeybee structure and how they work in their hive, similar in bumblebees too. However, the worker bees, the worker bumblebees can inflict multiple stings. So they will not lose their stinger upon stinging. They can retain it and sting repeatedly. The bumblebee, um, another key factor to tell a difference from the carpenter bee is that the bumblebee has uh, more rounded wings than the carpenter bee. We're gonna look at that here next. Here's the carpenter bee or the wood bee. Looks pretty close to the bumblebee, doesn't it? Let's go back, see there's the bumblebee. But we can see some key differences in the carpenter bee. This carpenter bee, AKA the wood bee, <clears throat> excuse me, is native to the United States. These bees are territorial. They are not opposed to swooping down and staring at predators. They're solitary bees, probably for that very reason. Um, and with facial recognition, these guys can be intimidating. Uh, the wood bee does not produce honey. Its abdomen is bald and slightly shiny, whereas the bumblebee is fuzzy. His abdomen is completely fuzzy. So there you can see an immediate difference between the bumblebee and the wood bee is the wood bee has the shiny abdomen. Another uh, way to identify the wood bee from the carpenter bee is if the shiny abdomen wasn't enough, is that the wings are more angular at the ends. However, they still do have some yellow and black for, uh, fuzz on them too. But how do these bees bore holes in wood? Well, they have mandibles or little tiny jaws that they will chew in circular motions to create holes in wood. They really don't do any structural damage to your house or anything like that, but you may find sawdust on windowsills or you know around the bottom of your stoop or something, or you may just even witness the holes in your trim and wonder, wow, what did that? And it's a carpenter bee. These guys have also been known as flower thieves and for drilling holes in the bottom of flowers that they can't get into from the top and stealing the pollen from the flowers on the underside when they bore a hole into them. These guys do have pollen baskets, but uh, they do not make honey. 
The males do not sting, or the drones do not sting, but the workers do. In these images, we can definitely see the side-by-side -side of the bumblebee on the left, and then just next to that, the carpenter bee. And then the image over to the right, you see the carpenter bee with the extremely shiny abdomen. And then on the far right, the bumblebee that's very fuzzy. You can see his rounded wings a little bit better too. Hey, Rob, thanks for tuning in. Mason bees. Mason bees are native. They do not make honey. They're solitary bees who like to hang out on their own. So there's no social order. They're very fast flyers. So you may not really even know it's a bee as it's buzzing by you. They don't have pollen baskets on their legs, but they do have pollen hairs on their abdomens and that allows them to collect pollen that way too. They're smaller than a honeybee and they have more of a metallic luster to them, a greenish blue luster to them. They will build nests with little pebbles and mud. They will even use bee hotels. I'm not sure you see in that bottom uh, image there, that's a, a bug hotel, if you will. Uh, they're pretty popular now. You can buy them at different places. Um, and uh, they do use them. I have one at my house and I do have insects that use them, though I couldn't tell you exactly what they are for, uh, I don't know all my bugs and I don't know all my bees. So it could be mason bees, I'm not sure. Uh, but these mason bees are so industrious that they actually will outwork honeybees. And this mason bee, this pollinator is very important in urban gardens. So we want to encourage more bees in our gardens. A digger bee, these guys are cute. They're kind of chunky and non-native, but there are 70 species in the United States. These guys are early spring bees, little chunky guys um, that are you know, black and white with some little yellow fuzz on the sides there. They will typically have their burrows in the ground and they will try to camouflage the entrance using various um, leaf litter, stumps, or even grass in the localized area. They're non-intimidating and are rather docile unless they're provoked, which of course we might become provoked if we felt threatened. Um, and what's interesting about the digger bee is that the female will actually secrete a little waterproof substance, like a little ball around each larva to protect it while it grows before it hatches. The leafcutter bee, just like his name sounds, this little guy uh, who is not native, he uses his little mandibles or his little jaws and he basically just cuts or saws off little chunks of leaves and uses them to build its nest. These guys uh, look a little bit like um, the digger bees, not quite as colorful, um, but they will build their nests in tube-shaped cavities and will also use will also use bug hotels, just like I mentioned in the last slide. They'll take the leaves that they've sheared and line their nest with them. And a lot of these leafcutter bees are actually um, host specific on plants, meaning they they prefer certain plants over others. And they really like legume pollens, so those would be like your beans. They're active mostly throughout the middle of the summer, roughly the same size as a honeybee, but they're loners. And they generally don't sting, but if so, it's not a crazy sting that's just you know gonna bring you to your knees. Squash bees, everyone wants squash bees in their gardens. Look how cute and chunky they are. Oh, they're just adorable. They're named for their favorite plant. They forage early in the morning or, or of an evening. So you'll see them early in the day or later in the evening because they like to um, they like to gorge on pollen from cucurbit plants or gourd plants in the gourd, in the gourd families. There's so many different varieties. Um, those plants, their flowers actually close in the afternoon. So that's why the squash bee will maximize when it's going to get uh, pollen is it will go early in the morning when the flowers are open or of an evening when they're open again. These guys are also solitary, similar in size to the honeybee. They only live a few months in the middle of the summer and only will sting if provoked. Doesn't it sound like that's a common thread with all the bees we've discussed so far? Yes, that they're, if they're threatened, then they will react. And so as long as we don't 
threaten them, they shouldn't react. And then we've got this little cute guy here, the sweat bee. He is a uh, native. He lives off pollen and nectar. He's very, just an iridescent, just metallic green. Uh, they're pretty small, but they're really common. Um, you would recognize them if it landed on you, but we don't need to be scared of these guys. They really have a wide variety of plants that they snack on. They're solitary, they keep to themselves. They like to live in the ground. But sweat bees are attracted to our sweat or perspiration, and they will actually lick the salt and the moisture from our sweaty skin. And research has shown that they, they, their best guess is that it provides some nutrients that they need, possibly for reproduction, but it also gives them a bit of moisture that they do need for their bodies. These guys are not aggressive and they will not sting. So if a sweat bee lands on you, don't be scared. He's just getting a drink. And finally, here's the slide I promised on the African honeybee or AKA the killer bee. This is a non-native hybrid bee. Back in the 1950s, the um, native bees, the Western honeybees that are native to the United States were bred uh, in Brazil and in South America to supplement the bee population and therefore the honey market. But then these bees sort of kind of outgrew their britches, if you will, and began migrating north. Um, so they are, you know, coming this way. Who knows when they're going to be here? They're not here yet, so it's okay. But the reason they're given the name killer bee, which is rather misleading, is it's, it's a characteristic of their behavior because they just don't let up. They're very aggressive. They're triggered by loud noises and vibrations. Uh, if you attempt to remove them, that's another way they're going to stay agitated longer than other bees. And they've been known to chase threats up to one and a half miles, hence the term killer bees, because they just don't give up. They're just, they obsess. The thing about the killer bee or the Africanized honeybee is that it can outcompete our native bees, and we need our native bees. Because they're so similar in size and appearance to the European honeybee, unless you had images side by side, you probably wouldn't be able to tell them apart in the wild. And again, we do not have killer bees in Indiana yet. This image here is, it's not really the best image to use because one's a little closer view than the other, but this the image on the left is the European honeybee that we've discussed extensively. And then on the right side is the Africanized killer honeybee. And just looking at them, they look very similar, don't they? So you would have to really know your bees and maybe even their knees to figure out which is the honeybee and which is the killer bee. We're almost through the program tonight. We've got a couple more slides here, but this one I wanted to mention. Some of you may have heard of colony collapse disorder. This was something that came to light back in 2006 when honeybee hives were, were in kind of a steep decline and it was unsure as to why this was happening. It's an abnormal phenomenon that can occur when a majority of worker bees leave the hive suddenly or they die and they just leave their queen, the food, the larva, they just leave everything and go. Or sometimes if a second queen is born, she may be kicked out of the hive and then those worker bees follow her. It's really not sure. But since about 2008, reports of CCD has actually been dropping. In the past, I think I think other terms that have been used for the colony collapse disorder is disappearing disease, spring dwindle, May disease, autumn collapse, or fall dwindle. So there are different names for a potentially naturally occurring process. Um, however, it could have been affected by pesticide usage, uh, mites or viruses that might um, contaminate the hive, or even malnutrition with lack of dietary needs. How can we help our bees? Let's plant for pollinators. Everybody loves our pollinators now that we've learned so much about bees. Now we know why they're better than bees because they just, they, they are, they're all the buzz. This list, this, these two lists here are just a few of the plants that bees really like. In fact, I think that any flower that you plant, a bee, a pollinator will appreciate. So we can do our part.
a few digital resources for you tonight if you're, you know, while you're at home now, if you want to check it out here in a little while. Some digital resources to investigate include the Indiana Native Plant Society. You can always check out the Indiana Department of Natural Resources Division of Entomology or their bug division. And then finally, you can even reach out to the Montgomery County Purdue Extension and ask them uh, probably about entomology and also some Indiana native plants. For right here in our library, if you wanted to visit the second floor reference uh, department, you could check out some of these books here, Bees and Natural History, uh, Pollinator Friendly Gardening, um, The Best Flowers for Midwest Gardens. So we have a variety of books um, on bees, for bees, for pollinators, and how to, how to plant for them. I encourage each of you, if you have the opportunity, to please come visit us on the second floor, and we'd be happy to locate these books for you. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight and sitting in and listening to our program on common bees of Indiana. Uh, the image you see here, the bees in your backyard, this is the book I promised that is going to be in the raffle this evening. So for those of you Montgomery County residents that are interested in receiving this book, you can enter the raffle by sending a question or a comment to ask at cdpl.lib.in.us. Ask at cdpl.lib.in.us. The bees in your backyard. Just put in the subject, the subject line bees, and that way we can make sure that your email gets directly to me. Um, so I encourage you to uh, participate in that raffle. Finally, for those of you that are on Read Squared with our summer reading program, thanks for tuning in. We have a secret code for you in order for you to receive a second raffle ticket for our summer reading program. That secret code is BOMBUS, the word BOMBUS. So you will enter this into your Read Squared app or on the website. BOMBUS is spelled capital B, as in boy, O-M-B-U-S, Bombus It has to be entered exactly as I spelled it. We'll do it one more time for you Resquared fans. Bombus, capital B, O-M-B-U-S, Bombus. So that's what you summer readers will put into your Read Squared. I congratulate you on winning already. And as soon as you're notified, uh, it'll be even better. Thanks again for coming out. I hope you learned a little something, but moreover, you had a lot of fun. And I want to put an announcement out for July 15th, the next program, FBI files. Yes, FBI files, fungus, bacteria, and invertebrates. We will be focusing on the decomposers and the food chain. So that'll be the, the down and dirty on um, our decomposers in the food chain. Again, thank you for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Thanks again, everybody. Hi, Jody. Thanks for popping in. Appreciate it. And uh, without further ado, we will conclude. Good night, Crawfordsville. <laughs>